Um, our next uh, speaker, moving on, is uh, Audrey Deering. Um, Ms. Deering is a genetic counselor. She's currently working in the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis team here at uh, uh, Guys and St. Thomas's. Uh, given her wealth of experience, she's the perfect speaker to talk us through the family planning options in ICC. Audrey, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I'm just hoping you see my slides. We do, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. OK, um, so following on from that lovely talk, I'm going to be talking about um, decision making and reproduction for um, people with inherited cardiac conditions. Um, I'm just going to fly through my slides quite quickly and hopefully um, have some time for questions at the end. So I guess it's just important to start with um, our kind of philosophy when thinking about reproductive options in that we try to provide people with non-judgmental options for their pregnancy and try to facilitate decision making that's right for them. Um, we find that it's best to discuss these things before the couple gets pregnant and um, partially of course because there's a time pressure during pregnancy but equally because there are options um, ahead of pregnancy that they might want to avail of. Um, and with that in mind, we do um, ask people to explore genetic etiology for conditions um, molecularly to help enable those choices of options. Um, and again, because of the time pressure and availability, we try to do that early on if, if possible. Um, so when we talk to people about what options are available to them, and especially in the genetic counselling um, appointments, these are the five main options that we tend to discuss. And then we spend most of our time discussing maybe two or three of them. Um, so of course they would be able to conceive naturally and to progress throughout the pregnancy um, with no further genetic intervention. Um, depending on the type of condition, there might be additional scans available during pregnancy. Um, so we can talk to them about what those might be. And we can also talk about the timing of testing after birth, whether that's at birth um, or later as um, the symptoms would be expected to occur. Um, we also talk to them about invasive testing, which is testing during pregnancy. Um, and there's two main um, uh, technologies for that that I'll discuss in a moment. Um, many times people come to us in genetics, in the clinical genetics department, because they want to talk about pre-implantation genetic testing, um, which used to previously be called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, so that's a type of fertility technology like IVF, where um, embryos are screened for the genetic condition. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, and then the two things that we touch on, but we don't tend to go into a huge amount of detail on are gamete donation. Um, so often, you know, if you have donor egg or sperm, that can eliminate the genetic risk of the cardiac condition in question, um, or of course, adoption. Um, but for my talk today, I'll be mostly focusing on invasive testing and PGT. Um, so you might be aware invasive testing is a um, outpatient procedure where a needle is passed through the abdomen and depending on the gestation of the pregnancy, either a small piece of placenta or some of the amniotic fluid is removed. Um, so we do um, remove a piece of the placenta, which is called chorionic villus sampling here at Guy's Hospital from about 11 weeks and three days gestation. Um, it's quite similar in different centres, um, just different uh, fetal medicine units are comfortable at slightly different gestations. Um, the benefit from doing a CVS, of course, is that it's as early as possible. Um, we expect that the placenta has the same genes as the rest of the pregnancy most of the time. Um, there is a associated risk of miscarriage with either of these. Some people say that CVS carries a slightly lower risk of miscarriage, or sorry, slightly higher risk of miscarriage at about half a percent to one percent, whereas an amniocentesis maybe is a bit lower, maybe closer to half a percent. Other people think there's not that much of a difference in miscarriage risks, especially at an experience center. And that, that is something that we tend to talk to people about. Um, usually we only offer invasive testing during pregnancy if couples were sure that they would end the pregnancy if it was affected by whatever genetic condition they're testing for. Um, the reason for that is if they were committed to the pregnancy, especially if it would not change clinical management during the pregnancy, it's much safer to test the child once they're born. Um, uh, so, you know, we would only do invasive testing if there was some kind of action that would be taken from it. Um, another thing to consider is the um, that, for example, for vascular EDS, um, introducing a needle into the abdomen can be quite risky for mum, so that's not often given as an option for these women. 
I think I've I've kind of covered most of these things. So yeah, there's a little bit of difference in the miscarriage risk for some people. Other people don't really think so. Um, and again, we would only offer that if we were thinking about ending that pregnancy. Um, so legally in the UK, one can end a pregnancy, certainly in England, not sure about other devolved nations, um, up until 24 weeks. Um, they can uh, avail of a termination of pregnancy after 24 weeks under a legal precedent called Clause E, which is referring to a significant um, disability. And it's, um, you know, the opinion of two medical professionals whether the condition in question will be a significant disability or not. So it might not be available after 24 weeks. Um, obviously, a hugely personal decision for the couple. Um, so here in clinical genetics, we can talk to couples during pregnancy about these options, whether to test or not, um, and help them again make a decision that's right for them and support them as they, as they um, you know, go through those steps. For couples who do not feel like that is um, acceptable to them, they can consider PGT. Um, so as I mentioned, PGT is similar to other types of IVF. Um, so basically, the woman is given hormone stimulation to create a lot of eggs. They're removed from her body in an outpatient procedure and fertilized with her partner's sperm or donor sperm in the laboratory. Um, when the fertilized egg or embryo is about a week old, we safely remove some of the cells and perform genetic testing for the known genetic condition of the family. Um, so if the embryo has inherited the genetic condition, um, there's nothing that we can do to fix that. So it is not gene editing, so we do not alter the DNA of the embryo in any way. We just simply would not use those embryos. So we would only put um, embryos back into the womb that have not inherited the genetic condition. Um, and again, I touched on before, we can only offer this an invasive testing if we know exactly what gene change we're looking for. Um, so we cannot uh, do a screen for common types of aerotopathies, for example. We can only look at known mutations. Um, now, understandably, there's a lot of um, legal and ethical guidelines in place for this type of technology. Um, uh, this is just kind of going over the embryo development. So again, they're about five or six days old once we do the testing. Um, so this is funded by the NHS. Um, I've listed below the NHS criteria for most of the devolved nations. So um, couples may not have uh, a healthy, unaffected child together. They are permitted to have children from previous relationships, just not together. Um, this is not the case in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland, they are able to have children together and they're still eligible for funding, but um, they're not in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, the couple, if they are a couple, have to be in a relationship for at least one year. They have to be living together, but they do not need to have lived together for a year. Um, both couple, both people have to be non-smokers. We ask that the female partner has a body mass index between 19 and 30. Um, this is um, partially due to maternal health, um, but also because the medications that are used to stimulate the ovaries are fat soluble. Um, so we know that they work best with it when within that BMI. Obviously, we know that can be a challenge for people who have um, greater height, maybe because of Marfan syndrome or something similar, but we do ask that they are within that BMI. Um, and finally, the female partner needs to be under the age of 40. Um, and due to the timeline that it takes to get somebody ready for treatment, often that means that we cannot accept referrals for women that are maybe more than 39 to six months, depending a little bit on the centre. Um, so NHS funding is available for single people and for same sex couples. Um, but unfortunately, the NHS funding does not cover things like gamete donation or if they require surrogacy, it does not cover that either. Um, so we would ask that people self-fund that portion of the treatment. Um, gamete donation costs for sperm is about £3,000 or so. Eggs are more expensive, maybe closer to £10,000. Um, and although surrogates are not allowed to profit, at least in the UK, off of being a surrogate, they can claim reasonable expenses. And of course, there's a lot of le legal paperwork that is required um, for surrogacy. So again, that can range around £10,000, £15,000 for that as well. Um, it's also worth thinking about surrogacy costs, maybe if uh, the female partner is not physically well enough to carry her own pregnancy, but still wants to use her eggs. That's something that we can do as well. And so creating the embryos in the lab and transferring them into a, a surrogate. Um, if a couple 
or individual does not meet the funding criteria, often this is because they have an unaffected child, they can self-fund their treatment, but of course it's quite expensive. Um, so it's about 10 to 15,000 pounds per cycle. Um, and we call a cycle the process of creating and genetically testing the embryos. Um, nationally, we are only allowed to accept referrals from clinical genetics. So if somebody is in a mainstream setting, say cardiology, and their couple or patient is interested in discussing this, we would ask that you would refer them to the local cl clinical genetics hub. I think there's 23 or so across the UK. Um, and that just ensures that we um, have the correct information about the genetic variant and that we've explored their alternative reproductive options and then they can choose to be referred on to discuss the treatment. Um, the gene change must be a confirmed pathogenic variant, um, which we count as a class four likely pathogenic or class five. Um, so unfortunately we cannot do a um, variant of uncertain significance even if you're clinically quite confident that it's the cause. It does need to be four or five um, according to the lab report. Um, there's also a body called the Human Fertility and Embryology Authority called the HFEA um, that legally permits centres to offer treatment for specific genetic conditions. And I'll have a slide that shows a little bit more about what I mean. Um, if a licence does not exist, then we can apply for one if we think it will meet the threshold for severity. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, so there's a couple of PGT clinics around the UK, one of course being Guy's Hospital, which is the largest in the UK. So we do about two thirds of cycles in the UK. Um, there's also um, the below centres that I'm aware do PGT as well. Um, so this is a screenshot for the HFEA. So you can see that there are some, um, there are licences based by OMIM number. So that's the number on the right hand side um, for specific phenotypes that have a licence. So in order to be licensed, conditions must need to be severe, but severe isn't really defined. Um, you can see that, um, for example, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is on here. Um, many types of DCM are on there, Marfan syndrome, low dietes, vascular EDS. These are all types of things that we would count as severe. Um, probably things like familial hypocholesterolemia would not be meeting that severity threshold. Um, so we tend to think about if a centre would offer termination of pregnancy for that condition, we think that that would likely meet this um, threshold for severity to have a HFEA licence approved. And again, we in genetics can apply for that for your couple. Um, PGT often sounds fantastic for couples, but there are some things to consider um, when embarking on the journey. It is extremely long, um, so even with a good waiting time, it's about 12 to 18 months from the first time we see somebody to when we'd hope that they would fall pregnant. Um, there are risks associated with the hormone stimulation. So um, the most severe risk is called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which can be life threatening. Um, so it's not without risks. Um, of course, we're usually doing this treatment to avoid passing on a genetic condition, but sometimes along the way, we can find that people have fertility problems and may therefore have a poor response to treatment whether that's because the embryos have inherited the genetic condition or they might not be that many to work from. And even if we get a healthy embryo, only about 50% of those will take as a pregnancy. Um, so it's obviously a big emotional investment for, this, for couples considering this. Um, that being said, uh, about two thirds of couples who have what we call a healthy or good fertility who start the PGD process will have a child, whether that's after one attempt or more. Um, it can be financially expensive, even though there's NHS funding, just on the number of trips that it takes to get to London or their, their centre. But of course, it can be a fantastic option for couples to, um, you know, they're very worried about having a child affected by the condition of the family, but don't feel like termination of pregnancy is ethically acceptable for them. Um, something that I thought we'd, you know, might lead nicely onto the next talk is that if the female partner has the cardiac condition, we will require a letter from her local specialist team to confirm that they're happy for her to undergo ovarian stimulation and to carry a pregnancy. Um, so this is things like, you know, actually being on that hormone treatment or undergoing the anesthesia required for the egg collection. Um, I mentioned before that women can consider surrogacy if they're not able to physically carry their pregnancy, but of course that can be quite expensive and finding a surrogate can take a huge amount of resources and time. Um, so, you know, I think for all of the five options that I've touched on, none of them are perfect. Um, they both, they all have a lot of pros and cons, and 
that's kind of why we're here in genetics is to help these couples weigh these pros and cons and to make a best fit decision for them. Um, so, you know, we ask questions about um, what ethically is acceptable, acceptable to them, um, if they have any belief system that might feed into that, what people in the family might think or feel about, about um, their reproductive choices, and to try to, again, give them something that is their best fit for them at that time. Um, so I'll put some extra links here that you can look at the conditions that are licensed for PGT, more about invasive testing, what we do in genetics. Um, and I'll leave it there if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Audrey. <laughs> really fantastic. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions at this stage or we'll revisit it at the end. Uh, yeah, I think the chat is OK. Uh, I definitely learned lots and I'll have to go through the slides again in the recording. <laughs> Thank you very much.